Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and today we're going to review the topics which are going to line up with exam one for statics here at Colorado State University. There will be future review videos for the remaining topics, but this one is going to cover essentially our chapter two through the first part of chapter five, which is free body diagrams. So we'll cover all those topics which we've covered in class. So going back to chapter two, you'll remember that we started talking about uh, essentially forces and other vectors. Okay, we had vectors versus scalars. The main difference between those is the direction, right? Vectors had direction, scalars did not. Everything else is exactly the same. A lot of different terms we can express in terms of both a vector or a scalar. If we talk about the magnitude of a force, that's going to be a scalar. If we talk about a force having a direction, as in a gravitational force pulling toward the center of the Earth, or a pushing force as you're pushing um, your car against the car in front of you. I wouldn't recommend that, um, but that would be a force versus a scalar magnitude. Uh, as we got into vector addition, there was two different ways we could do vector addition. One of those was to use triangles. And of course, three vectors work to make a vector triangle, hence the word triangle. So we can use trigonometry, law of sines, law of cosines, uh, if you wanted to. But you can always add components. Okay, You can break down your vectors into components. Now, the components are going to be aligned with your coordinate system. It doesn't have to be a horizontal vertical. right? Our standard coordinate system, which we often default to, is horizontal and vertical, but realize you could rotate that if you'd like to, and if it helps simplify some of your components. Coordinate systems are tools to use. They're not an absolute thing. They don't actually change your answers. They just give you an intermediary to express things in. We also talked about univectors. Remember that univectors have a length of only one unitless thing. It's not actually even, it's not a foot, it's not a meter, it's not a newton. A length of one with no units. So fundamentally, they don't have a magnitude because they have a magnitude of one, but they're pure direction. Okay, so a unit vector is 100% direction. So if you want to add direction to a vector and you have a unit vector, you just multiply that unit vector times the magnitude and it turns into vector components. Now, in two dimensions, you have long been doing unit vectors, whether you knew it or not, every time you took a sine or a cosine of an angle. Fundamentally, the sine of an angle and the cosine of an angle create a unit vector along the hypotenuse. Okay, so you've been doing that for a long time. Uh, you probably didn't ever think of it as a unit vector. For unit vectors, we typically think about those in more of a three-dimensional sense. And what we're going to do there is we're going to find the position vector. We're going to find the length of that position vector and then divide the position vector by its scalar length. Okay, so essentially this is our equation right here. And we can create the components. It turns out we can also use direct and cosine angles. And that's because if you take a look at these equations closely, right, we have the scalar length, and this is scalar is in positive or negative component in the top, and then the length of the full vector in the bottom. And isn't that the exact same thing that we did for our unit vectors, right? Components divided by length. So same thing here. And now these angles, these direction cosine angles are complex 3D angles that wrap from the positive axes. Okay, so let me just write this out. That these direction cosine angles wrap from the positive axes, x, y, and z, to a vector. Okay, so if you end up with any direction cosine angles greater than 90, it means that your component in that direction is going to be negative. And there's some really good interactives. If, we, if you go back to our course content, there's some GeoGebra interactives. You can take a look and, and visualize these direction cosine angles. Now, we also used polar projections as we were defining our angles and defining our components. And these polar projections essentially were projecting a vector into a plane. So what these often would look like is that if we have a right-hand coordinate system, let's go with x, y, and z. And let's say that we have a force vector going back here. We could use some uh, ghost diagrams. So straight down, back here into the y-axis. Let's see here, back off the negative x, here, 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 something like that. Gets us close to defining that basically this vector is going back behind the yz plane. 
and so it's going to have a negative x component, a positive z, and a positive y. And what we did with this vector is we projected it down into a plane. In this case, we're going to project it down into the xy plane. So in our notes, we called this vector a, and we called this vector that was projected. Now you can call it a couple of things. You could call it a prime if you wanted to. You could also call it if you wanted to, um, like a and the xy. Right, the projection of A down into that XY plane. And as we defined these angles, fundamentally we defined one angle from kind of in that plane. So often, doesn't technically matter, but often we called that one theta and possibly called this one down from the Z axis phi. We did learn in looking at these that you want to make sure you derive the components each time, right? Realize that the three components of the vector A, I'll draw these in dotted lines, here would be my AX. Uh, the AY is going to be, excuse me, that's parallel to the Y. That one's going to be AY. AX is coming back in this direction right here. And then AZ is going to be going along the Z axis. Okay, so this would be AZ. So you can find those three different components. Like I said, first by projecting the A vector down into the XY plane. And then basically breaking this, keeping this as a hypotenuse, noting we have two different right triangle corners. One of those is right here, and a second one is right here for the two right triangles we'll use for polar projections. Um, we also then talked about vectors between two points, um, and we started with a line between two points. You certainly can take the final, um, final point minus the initial, I honestly think it's a little bit easier to just take a look at the change in position between the two points. And so you can look at that kind of isolated in your X, isolated in your Y, isolated in your Z. You get the same answer either way. I just see a good number of algebra errors that happen when people really just focus on the coordinates and taking final coordinates minus initial coordinates. Uh, next, we got into the dot product. And the dot product always gives us a scalar. Okay, It's one of our two different ways that we can multiply vectors. And this is the type of multi vector multiplication that tells us how much of one vector is parallel to another. Cross products tell us how much one of a vector is perpendicular to the other, fundamentally. And so we have some different ways we can compute dot products. This is the the two different kind of algebraic um, ways, the length of A times the length of B times the cosine of the angle between them, or we take the sum product of our similar components, right? AX times BX plus AY, BY plus AZ times BZ. Add all those up. And once again, we get a scalar value every single time from a dot product. Some of the uses, we can find the angles between two vectors. This is often more for three-dimensional vectors than it is for two-dimensional vectors. Two-dimensional, we often create right triangles and just kind of work through our, our trig that way. Um, a couple notations here is that we have either a scalar magnitude, okay? The scalar magnitude meaning the amount, right? Not a vector, but the amount or length of one vector that is along another. And we use this COMP um, indicating this is the component, okay? The scalar magnitude or the scalar component of one vector along another. And then we have the projection, P-R-O-J, okay? So a component gives us a scalar, a projection gives us a vector. And you'll notice the only difference between these two equations is this extra little b hat over here. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the length of the scalar component and then we're multiplying it times the unit vector along b, which pushes it back into vector space, adds in the direction, makes it into a vector projection. Uh, we're also able to find the vector portion of one vector along another. Essentially after we find this projection, we then can set up a vector equation I can just write that out here. Say we had, it was called vector A. So if we had vector A, um, and this is going to, you're going to subtract off of this the projection of A relative to B, and this is going to equal the amount of A, which is perpendicular to B. Okay, because fundamentally, your amount of A parallel to B and your amount of A perpendicular to B, if you add those together, you end up back with the vector A. Okay, and so we went through that in one of our examples. 
Next, we moved into particle equilibrium. Keep in mind that as we dealt with particle equilibrium, that we assumed that all forces were concurrent, which means all those forces go to the same point. And because of that, we don't need to worry about moments. Okay, so all of particle equilibrium is essentially force equilibrium. So our fundamental equation there is sum of all forces equal zero, either two equations for 2D or three equations for 3D. One of the items we looked at in chapter three were pulleys and we talked to this thing about frictionless pulleys okay frictionless pulleys meaning that all they're going to do is just transmit the tension from one side of the pulley into the other side of the pulley fundamentally if you have a whole bunch of frictionless pulleys chained together you have the exact same tension along your entire length of cable so none of those pulleys are going to rob any tension from the cable also in um, particle equilibrium, all of the bodies that we dealt with, all the bodies that were connected to our particles were two force members. Remember the two force members are all cables here in statics. They're all weightless links. So weightless links are um, essentially any body that has two pins with no mass. Okay, so the only forces going through there are either tension or compression. There's also some springs, but all of these show up as two force members, which also show up on our chapter five um, reactions and support table. So you can refer to that as you're thinking about what are these two force members. So getting into our free body diagram in chapter three, we had four steps. We wanted to first isolate the body. We wanted to add our axes, add applied forces, and add our reaction forces. That's what creates a free body diagram. Every single equilibrium problem in statics needs a free body diagram. The problem may not ask for a free body diagram. It may say solve for the reactions or find the tension in this cable. It is your responsibility to recognize, hey, this is an equilibrium problem. I need a free free body diagram. Once you have the free body diagram, you basically interpret it into equations. And these equations I was referring to right here, two equations for 2D, three equations for 3D. On to the next page of the review sheet. Uh, and this moves us into chapter four, right? Which is actually the last full chapter that's gonna be here on exam one. And so we'd start talking about moments. Now, uh, moments are more challenging than forces. Put some effort in, learn a right hand rule, learn how to do some cross products, um, learn to understand what a moment even is, right? It's the rotational tendency of a force. It is not a push, it's a twist. Okay, forces are pushes or pulls. Um, moments are twists in some way around multiple axes if you're looking at three-dimensional moments. And so we had three different ways that we could compute these moments. One of those was simply looking at a perpendicular distance. The perpendicular distance mode works great, um, but this u hat vector is kind of complex as you get into three-dimensional systems. This unit vector is perpendicular to both R and F. So easy enough if your two forces, if your force and your position vector in the plane of your page, right? Because then all of your moments, all of your cross products are going to be either into or out of the page. Um, but as soon as we get into three-dimensional moments, then things get a little more complicated. We also can use basically kind of a scalar formulation, the length of R times the length of F times the sine of angle between those. Once again, not horrible in 2D, but this unit vector, sorry, I used two different labels here for the unit vector. Let's call this U hat. Um, Finding that unit vector perpendicular to both R and F is challenging on a 3D problem. Uh, then we got into kind of the full vector determinant. And quite honestly, if you struggle with um, finding, sorry, I just saw here again this U hat. If you struggle with the right hand rule, the determinant is a good friend of yours. You can actually put in even um, just signs, right? If you know if you have a positive X and a negative RY, and, and you can actually look through your cross products using one of these determinants to validate what direction your moment will be going in. I think it's most efficient to learn a right hand rule technique, either the slide and curl or the three finger right hand rule. So we can feed things through a determinant. The reason that we get a vector out of a determinant are these three little unit vectors up top. Realize you're actually multiplying those times your kind of cross multiples of the R and F terms. And if we really think about what a moment, excuse me, what a cross product does, right? A cross product tells us how much of one vector is perpendicular to another. So if you cross any two vectors that are parallel, you get zero. If you cross any two vectors that are perpendicular, you just multiply their magnitudes and then that times that unit vector that's perpendicular to both of them. So 
we can recognize in a two-dimensional problem that all of our x components of position vectors are going to be multiplied times our y components of forces, right? So if you already have a position vector and a force vector in components, simply cross the two perpendicular pairs, add those together, that's going to give you your moment um, value as well. And all of these, I put moment about point for all the subscripts here, just to indicate that all moments are about a point. And the r vector, right? So if this this is our point and this is our force. Keep in mind that the R vector always goes toward the force, right? You can think about this as a Star Wars reference if you want to go to the force. Um, and it goes away from that point. If you flip the R vector around, you'll get a negative error on every single cross product that you take. So one of the applications that we use moments on is not only to find a moment about a point, but also to find a moment about a line or an axis. And what that's really doing is it's projecting a moment about a point onto a line. And so we're doing a combined dot product cross product, and we can combine those into a single determinant in what's called a mixed triple. And so the main difference between a mixed triple and your standard cross product determinant is really this top row, right? We've replaced the unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat, with the unit vector components along our axes or line of interest, okay? Whatever line that we're going to find the moment about is gonna be the unit vectors in that top row. The R vectors, we open up even more opportunity with the R vectors because our R vectors go anywhere from our line of interest, basically anywhere from that unit vector in the top row to anywhere on the force line of action, okay? It's like infinity plus infinity choices Practically, there's only ever a handful, but they'll all give you the same moment around your axes. And then the third line here is our force vector components. This is not the unit vector. This is not some other position vector. This is just the force vector components and nothing but. Um, once you compute this mixed triple, you will get a scalar all the time. The reason you get a scalar is because these are all numbers. There's not a single vector, an i hat, j hat, anything else. Now, they're all magnitude of vector components, but there are no vectors inside this determinant. And so taking this determinant, it's just a mathematical operator on this three by three matrix. We get a scalar value. We then can multiply that scalar value by the unit vector along our axes of interest, essentially by these same three components, as long as you add back in the i hat, j hat, and k hat, and we'll turn this scalar magnitude into a vector, basically pushing it onto that vector line. Another application we had of moments was finding couples. Now remember that couples are pure rotation. There is no net force in a couple, okay? If, even if you have two equal opposite non-collinear forces, which could look something like this. So here's F and here's F, the sum of those forces, as long as I drew them parallel, they're close, would equal zero. But what they do create is they create rotation, okay? And so often we'll draw this as a, I call it often a resolved couple, which I, I like using the um, variable C for couples. And so we can basically take these two equal opposite and non-collinear forces, remembering that if we want to use R cross F, we always point our R vector at the force we're gonna cross. Okay, so you can really think that it's the same thing as summing moments around this point right here, where you're gonna have no moment from the top force and only a moment from this lower force. And that would give you a couple in units of force times length. So this just contrasts the difference between couples and or moments, and essentially just says, add them up. If you have some of these resolved couples and you also have some R cross F moments, all of those will show up in your sum of moment equations. And if you fail to recognize that you have a pair of these equal opposite non-collinear forces, do not worry about it. Do not sweat. Uh, if you just simply sum your moments about any point in that system, you'll get the same answer. Okay, so everything will work out just fine. The last section we had in chapter four was looking at transformations. Now, it really just highlighted that we've been doing a whole bunch of different types of transformations all throughout chapter two and into chapter four, right? Chapter three was equilibrium, so it was a little bit different. And so it's just saying that we've been transforming equivalent systems um, all throughout, and then here we're just calling them resultants. And so you've already taken resultant forces, and this says now we can take resultant forces and moments. Noting that the location of your moment matters, the location of your resultant moment, because those R vectors are going to change, right? In your R cross F moments. Now the couples, you're just gonna add in. It doesn't 
doesn't matter if you have a couple right over the top of the point you're summing moments about, you will add in that couple either way. And then the last section that will be on the exam is rigid body equilibrium. Now the same steps to create a rigid body free body diagram as we had for a particle. There's really just one modification here and it's saying add some dimensions. Now to be honest, I will never mark you off on a free body diagram if you don't have dimensions. If you're missing some of the other things, I will mark you off. Okay, free body diagrams are one of the key things that you need to leave statics knowing. How to make accurate free body diagrams of rigid body systems. You will use this skill over and over and over in your future classes. Um, and I'd say one other really key thing that's on this exam is understanding moments, right? Understanding the right hand rule, being able to take a cross product. So those are some of the key things. So there will be no equilibrium equations. There will be nowhere that you need to um, basically take a free body diagram of a rigid body. Keep in mind that chapter three is still on this exam. So chapter three covers particles, but you won't have to take a free body diagram and sum forces in the X equals zero, some forces in the Y equals zero, or some moments about some point equals zero. That will come up on the next exam, but we're gonna keep this one to just free body diagrams. Let's go ahead and switch over to look at some of these, the reactions that come from supports. Now I've clustered them together on this table essentially to include all the similar ones. Okay, so we have normal supports here in the top row, normal supports, because we have one single normal force. The normal force is perpendicular to the contact surface. Keep in mind that every time I say support force, you can think in your brain, oh, that resists translation. A support couple resists rotation. So if we have one of these normal supports on our free body diagram, we're going to have one single unknown normal force, either pushing or pulling on that free body diagram. The two force supports, the three of them are highlighted here in yellow, a cable, a weightless link. So weightless link, as long as it's pinned on both ends and has no weight applied to it, no couples, no other forces, nothing else, just two pins, that's going to be a two force body. We call those weightless links or more generally a two force body. Springs also are a two force body as long as actually for those as well that we neglect their mass, which we tend to do with springs. And we can find out the spring force is equal to the displacement from neutral. That's what the delta is times the spring constant K. Once again, two force members apply one single force in the direction of that member. Okay, basically in line with it. The easiest one I think to think about is cables, right? Cables are flexible. If you pull on them, you get tension and that tension is exactly in the line with the cable. A weightless link can be either tension or compression and a spring can also be either in tension or compression. Then in the rest of the table here, we get into multi-force reactions, basically multi-force um, and or couple reactions. And so a pin is a really common one that we see in statics. Best way to resolve that is into two independent components, one in the X, one in the Y. That's the easiest thing to solve for in your algebra. The next one with two reactions here is this fixed collar on a smooth rod. Okay, one normal force coming from the rod and then a resistant couple, resisting rotation coming from the wide collar, not allowing it to rotate around that rigid rod. And then the last couple here, we have a rough surface. I put this one on, although we, we spend an entire chapter talking about friction, it's just good to at least acknowledge the fact that we can have, instead of just a smooth surface, we can have a rough surface. And essentially we pick up a friction force, which is parallel to that surface. The normal force is gonna remain perpendicular. And then the last support we have is a fixed support. Okay, fixed, welded, bolted, um, set in concrete, anchored, whatever you wanna call it. And basically we can resolve these supports into two independent force components and then additionally a resistant rotational couple. Now I've mentioned this before but it's, it's just worth mentioning again that uh, especially for these multi-force systems, all these ones in the bottom, multi-force or force and couple systems, these are equivalent supports. The reality is that there's really kind of a single force support that comes from a pin, and that's really more represented by this situation over here. One single force support at an unknown angle, and these two systems over here with resistant couples, fundamentally you have a complex varying um, distributed load at the interaction between either the collar and the rod or between the, the, the rod here, the body and the ground or whatever 
whatever it's, it's fixed to. And so we can equivalently resolve them. We can represent them as these forces here, but the actual interaction between these materials is actually a bunch of different distributed forces of changing magnitudes. Um, and so what we're representing here is just way easier computationally to think about, um, but it's always worth, it's always good to point out that there isn't actually two little clean forces that show up inside of a pin, just like there's not two force components and a rotational couple that show up inside of a fixed support. Um, the interaction between materials is more complex. So that concludes our review for exam one. Please reach out with any questions that you may have. I believe in you and thanks for your hard work.